Hello and welcome everyone to the cost of an action session, the importance of pandemic preparedness and prevention at the source. We'll have fantastic lineup of speakers and we have question and answers and Kim Kutzmacher, uh, she did a great job in preparing this session. We'll take your questions from on the online community. Thanks a lot for the BMZ for hosting this and Kim personally. To start us off, I don't know if you're aware of this, but we're in a fucking crisis. This is so many crises happening at the same time that we don't know where to start. And the One Health approach is urgent, it's necessary, but it doesn't make it easier to start. The World Bank's World De Development Report um, this year states that the COVID-19 pandemic triggered the largest global economic crisis seen in more than a century. And this is just starting now. And we are having estimates of the legal and illegal wildlife, uh, wildlife trade, which is maybe 20 billions as well. So where does the money flow? Where does the money go? Why is it so difficult to convince more people that it's so much cheaper <laughs> to prevent the pandemic than to cure for everything that's coming after this. Prevention is always cheaper, but um, as a medical doctor and a faculty member of the Charité, we only learned this, to view the patient on a one-on-one -on -one basis, to think that medicine starts with a patient. And what this pandemic could tell us all that a new way of looking at health is public health, is prevention, is to understand that a virus doesn't ask for a nationality before it crosses the border. In the same stance, a CO2 molecule doesn't ask what, who emitted it. It's just overheating everything. So let's talk about how to put the glory back into prevention and how we desperately need to think more about the pre-spillover prevention and to crack down the international wildlife trade as soon as possible. And to start us off for this topic, we have a great movie which will raise um, the awareness of this for all who are not already part of this alliance. The world we live in is inextricably linked. Almost 75% of all emerging infectious diseases are zoonotic, originating from animals, the majority from wildlife. We see how destruction of nature and the unsustainable use of natural resources, including the extraction and use of wildlife, increase risks of zoonotic spillover, a danger that can lead to pandemics. We know that wildlife is not our enemy. It is an integral part of biodiversity on Earth. It is our human behavior that puts us at risk. Environmental health, animal health, and human health are fundamentally interconnected. Therefore, we need a holistic approach that is collaborative, multisectoral, and interdisciplinary, and works at the local, regional, national, and global level. We need to focus on preventive and sustainable measures, and we need a joint approach to reduce health risks from wildlife trade and consumption. In September 2021, the International Alliance Against Health Risks in Wildlife Trade was launched as an inclusive and interdisciplinary platform. To date, more than 100 national and international political and civil society organizations are participating including indigenous communities as well as research institutions. The Alliance is driven by evidence-based insight. We address the entire wildlife trade spectrum, from hunting and handling through trading to consuming wildlife and its products. To reduce the risks of future outbreaks, epidemics and pandemics, we translate the commitment, knowledge and political will of our members by providing and communicating evidence, helping to design countermeasures, and supporting and evaluating interventions. Finding solutions that work. 
while concurrently improving health, equity and well-being for all species through a One Health approach. Strategies to identify and address health risks are complex. They must be context-specific and culture-sensitive and require interdisciplinary knowledge exchange, well-coordinated inclusive planning, co-creation and joint actions of many different actors. The Alliance helps to join forces for a common cause and expand each member's radius. We offer matchmaking among members to enable new collaboration and partnership. We translate scientific evidence, insights from indigenous communities and knowledge systems into concrete policy recommendations. To drive actual changes on the ground, we broker knowledge and insights. We encourage and empower evidence-based orientation and regulation. By offering guidance to involved communities and authorities, we help change behavior and improve policy implementation. The membership is based on transparency, equal terms and equal say. We acknowledge the complementarity of the very diverse actors and action fields involved. Through our combined knowledge, we'll narrow the gap between science and implementation, and global awareness, policies and practice will be improved. With our joint action, we will help to substantially reduce unnecessary health risks posed by close contact across the entire wildlife trade spectrum. This is our vision, a world of healthy and safe coexistence of people, animals and the ecosystems that they are part of. I think it's a great movie and um, just to get you in the idea of how we want to use this uh, precious time that we have together at the World Health um, uh, Summit, I would like to introduce the speakers in a rather unusual way. You can read all their great uh, CVs in the, <laughs> in the book, lit. but I wanted to ask everyone first, what is precious to you personally? because we have everything to lose that is the basis of a good life, and we have so much to win. And this winning narrative, which is completely lost during the war times at the moment, this has to gain more momentum. And so I would like, uh, like to start with Jochen Flassbart. He is the State Secretary of the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, the BMZ in German. Jochen, you sent us a picture. Um, and I would love to uh, listen to the story. Th this is you in, where is this? Guess, where could this be? <laughs> so, somebody has an idea? No, no, it's, it's in Fiji. Okay. And uh, that was in, um, you, you might recall that in 2017, we had an extraordinary specific. Uh, you have Asia on your, on your forehead <laughs> because of the presentation. <laughs> on the top of your mind, so to speak. No, I don't want to make Africa jealous. Um, so, um, uh, in 2017, we had this Fiji COP in Bonn. Uh, and uh, so I took the occasion to visit our friends there on Fiji and not only in conference rooms, but also out in the forest. Uh, and what you see is a project that we are running through GIZ there. Uh, on sustainable forest and the protection of uh, forests. And that is something very much uh, what we are looking at when we are talking about One Health. We will go deeper into that. And I thought it's a nice picture. Uh, the green spots are the only untouched uh, spots and the different colors uh, show uh, indicate how intense forest management uh, is. Uh, the, the orange one, I think, is, well, unsustainable, mm -hmm. uh, as you can imagine. Yeah, you've been the president of the NABU, or you are very deeply into the biodiversity field as well. You just changed uh, from the environmental section of the uh, government to the um, BMZ now. But one of the big things that I remember from our last time in, in Glasgow is 
where do you get the money from? How do you raise the awareness of, of, the, of the urgency? And we just spent a thousand billion for the recovery of the economy in Europe. You are part of uh, the German government. Uh, I don't know how to translate Doppelwumms, but <laughs> our chancellor said he is going to take out the bazooka for the economy, for the military. But where does the pandemic preparedness come in with the Wumms? Yeah, I, I think we are doing much more uh, than we did. But to be honest, it's still not sufficient. And uh, I think uh, uh, in uh, Christian Drosten said it once, there is no glory in prevention. Uh, that is as simple as that. And it is as tragic uh, as that. So we have to fight for that uh, to be better off. Uh, I think we have uh, sent some very important signals also as G7 presidency um, uh, on filling in into the international uh, divergent funds uh, for, for global health, uh, but still a lot has to do, has and, to be done. Um, what are your expectations of the fifth of the financial intermediate fund of the World Bank? Do you think this is moving? Yeah, it is moving. Uh, and I mean, uh, the Chancellor gave the announcement of uh, 50 million. We added uh, through the Ministry of Health another 19 million. So we are there now with 69 uh, uh, million uh, euros to be part of the um, of the fifth at the World Bank. And I, uh, uh, Svenja Schulze just came back from, from the World Bank uh, uh, annual meeting. And she there said, we, we have to invest money more in structural changes. It's not that we're just looking at the project level with regard to climate, with regard to health preparedness. We have to look at it more structurally to uh, change the, uh, the problems at the source. And I think we are discussing right now exactly today what it means. Yeah, thank you very much for being here and to re represent the um, German government. Um, the next uh, person on the panel is Maria, Maria Neira. Um, you, you send a picture when I ask everyone what is dear to you, you send a picture of yourself. <laughs> Well, uh, you asked me to represent something that I care about. And, and I care about so many things. No, 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 it, it's not me. <laughs> what I was elaborating my sentence. What I care about... We had about, to cut off your husband. Is, well, I have plenty of friends and family and all of that. I said, well, but I cannot represent my own family. What I care about is, is so many things that I say, what can represent, one thing can represent, and this is the one that represents me. I care about the sun. I mean, having this positive energy and that the nature that you see behind, if we can keep this view and if we can wake up every morning and see an, a, an ecosystem that is protected, oof, then we can breathe, we can eat, we can have proper water. And probably this is the, the best way I found to summarize what I care for, the sun. And not just because I'm Spanish, so. Yeah. And you you light up the room wherever you start to shine. <laughs> um, we last met at, uh, at the COP and you were talking about the connection of air pollution. And, and this was new to me that, that the, the severe cases of COVID-19 are correlated with air pollution because the, the virus takes the, the particles like a taxi to get deeper into the lungs. And this is a good example that's often missed in the communication that these things are interlinked. People who have already a pre-damaged lung are more susceptible to uh, infections and stuff. And we know about the rise of allergies which are connected to air pollution. And I wonder why the story of what you have to gain is not part of the renewable energy discussion at the moment. We would have with renewables a lot less air pollution, but why, why does this narrative, um, because we, this, this picture illustrates this nicely, what is dear to us, it's our body, it's our soul, it's our air to breathe, yeah. and this doesn't come into the political domain. Well, we are trying very hard. I mean, we have created a platform called Energy and Health. We are trying to, Ministers of Energy and Ministry of Health, to talk. Because for us, as the, the, the global health community, if we do not accelerate this transition to renewable, clean sources of energy, our health will never 
recover and will never be better. We have 7 million premature deaths every year caused by exposure to air pollution. And yes, of course, if you have a, a virus or a bacteria that is uh, transmitted via respiratory I, and you have been living on a city where the pollution levels have been very high for a long time, of course, you will be much more exposed and uh, your lungs will be much more vulnerable to any infectious agent. Yeah. So we need to accelerate this transition to uh, renewable sources of energy. Great to have you on, on, the, on the panel later on. I would love to uh, turn to you, Andy. Uh, Andrew Peter Dobson is Professor of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Princeton University. And you put out a great paper in Science Magazine about the cost of inaction. And this is the picture that you send us. Thank you. I was just hoping you could project Barcelona on my head for the game later tonight. <laughs> <laughs> One of the tragedies of COVID was soccer stopping for nearly a year. I did sort of two things during COVID. I wrote lots of equations and looked at lots of data. And the way of recovering sanity after that, Uh, was to rewild my garden, tear out all the non-native species, replace them with native plants, forming both a tiny little nature reserve for birds and butterflies, and also a minuscule sink for carbon. Mm -hmm. Because those are the other huge ex existential problem facing humans, climate change and loss of biodiversity. If you look at how well governments of the world dealt with COVID, you realize we're in deep shit. You can count on the fingers of one hand the numbers of governments that dealt really well with COVID. Germany, possibly, mm. Italy, New Zealand, Panama, mostly, which kept the canal open and 22% of world trade working. But we need a better political understanding of the environmental problems right through to infectious diseases. Mm. Otherwise, good night, grandchildren. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... In, at medical school, I learned a very uh, important order. If you are not sure about the diagnosis, don't talk about treatments. Yeah. And in a way, uh, this order has not reached political communication that, that the politicians all around the world stand up and say, as you are very <laughs> direct, we're in a deep shitty situation. And this is really urgent and it's a planetary health emergency. And then people could much easier understand why we have to take drastic measures in prevention and in uh, yeah more resilient health systems. But this diagnostic part has been suddenly uh, strangely been forgotten in a way. We talk about measure here, measure there, but we are not getting the the big picture across. Uh, I'm a big fan of the Don't Look Up movie at Netflix. Yes. <laughs> Raise your hand if you have seen it. It's such. <laughs> And it's such a brilliant example of the psychology of not looking at real big issues. And um, uh, you calculated and you brought us on some slides, and I, I would love to uh, change to your presentation, how much easier would it be and how much cheaper would it be to prevent uh, the next pandemic or make it less likely? Um, Andrew, the floor is yours. Um, well, hopefully we can do the slides later, uh, 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 unless you want to do them now. I, I thought, get them out of the way. Okay, fantastic. If we could go straight <laughs> to the slides. <laughs> and then later on, we have the discussion with all the people in the group and the online discussion. That, that's the idea. If I could do that from here, that would be great. Okay. So I did put together some slides. I will, I will probably skip over some of them because I didn't realize what sort of time I'd have. Essentially, what we've been trying to do is look at emerging pathogens. This is a famous graph by Mike, Mark Woolhouse, which shows that roughly two new viruses of humans are identified every year. The key point here is that not all of those cause an epidemic straight away. Zika virus appears just in the early 1960s. We don't get an epidemic until 2016, 2017. HIV probably emerged in the 1930s. It took 50 years before we suddenly noticed we had a huge global pandemic on our hands. So we don't only have to know what's, what's what out there, we need to know more about the biology and epidemiology of those viruses. We could replot that data as we did in this second paper that followed the earlier one in science, just looking at the ones that caused epidemics since the great post-World War I influenza. These are pandemics plotted by size, number of people infected, number of continents 
infected by color and financial cost. The last dot, COVID, is an underestimate. It's also not the last dot. We have a major H5N1 epidemic circling in birds and now in marine mammals around the whole Northern Hemisphere. It's just a matter of time before someone's dog eats one of those birds and seals, and then we've got influenza in humans again. So again, the uh, show is not over yet. The other thing you should notice is we have more and more years when we don't have a pandemic. That's for a number of reasons. It's because we've got lots of little templates out there to pick up epidemics. They're called humans. So if you plot out the time between epidemics in terms of number of years of humans' lives lived, or number of children's born at the bottom, the more of us there are, the more we live for, the more likely we're to sample new viruses and trigger a new epidemic. There's two ways of thinking of this epidemic. One is to look at the, the proportion of viruses that jump over. That's the blue line. It's a relatively small proportion of what's out there. That's because there's so many viruses out there. Roughly most other species have five to 10 viruses. There may be eight to 10 million to 20 million other species out there. Be very worried or be more relaxed because that means only a tiny proportion of those viruses have jumped over. If you looked at the cost of stopping it early on, when you have a very low probability of them coming across, it doesn't cost a lot. You're investing in looking at what's out there, finding what it does, storing the RNA in global databases so as we can quickly make vaccines, developing tests for things we haven't seen before, because the tests make all the difference. Once it starts taking off, it's a less and less chance of it happening, but it's going to cost us more and more and more, up to, we've seen, of the order of 30 to 50 trillion for COVID. We know the mechanisms. It's tropical deforestation on one hand, which is also coupled with a wildlife trade. All of the hotspots, the emergence of Ebola around Central Africa, where these Ebola has broken out. Globally, if we look for a range of your favorite recent viral pathogens, it's all to do with land use change. And you can make simple models for that, which we've done. Essentially, as land use change conversion proceeds, the perimeter between the area converted, which is uh, now converted to agricultural land and the, the land of forest or savanna with viruses in it increases. You can work out the risk of it, something coming over. And ironically, it's not a peak perimeter. It's at about 75%. That's because you've got more people, little Petri dishes to pick up the diseases in the matrix as more land is converted. And something we haven't even addressed here is that perimeter that maximizes the probability of disease transfer from wild species to human species is also the perimeter that transfers, maximizes the transfer of ecosystem services. So we can't have both. So we've got to think of using a different reason, maybe keeping the forest intact in the first place or restoring it. The other problem, as we said, is the wildlife trade. Other people are going to talk more about this. I'm just going to show you one graph. Two graphs, actually. That is monitored by CITES, which was set up in 1975, 76. The left-hand graph shows you trade to the US through Singapore, partly because we would just look at the trade through Singapore. It's got a relatively honest government, and you can get a magnitude of trade to other different countries in the world. It quickly stabilizes that of the order of 10,000 packages of wildlife going through Singapore to the US, you can see a comparison with China which goes up much more slowly. Essentially, what you're seeing there is China's economy growing. But also it means the US can't blame China because it's still an order of magnitude less trade to China than it is to the US. But this is only the legal. This is only legal trade. And that's the bottom line. Why is this only the legal trade? Because does anybody know what the annual budget for CITES is? It's $7 million a year. That is less than uh, one second trading on the New York Stock Exchange. 195 nations pay into that. Most of them forget to give all the money each year. So that's pathetic. <laughs> the, the amount of money we've got to monitor the trade in wildlife is one second's trading on the New York Stock Exchange. I mean, what are we as humans if that's how we value wildlife? What is it if we value our own risk? You can get an estimate of that risk. These are great data from the EcoHealth Alliance. These are just 
numbers of bats that people in the wildlife trade are exposed to on the bottom pink line, a number of primates, and the number of new viruses detected in that. This shows you how lucky we've been. If your job is collecting bats and selling them, you're probably going to want to sell more than a thousand a year. That means you've been exposed to approximately 40 unknown viruses. And there's lots of people making a living out of that. If you're dealing in monkeys, you've got to sell maybe a couple of hundred monkeys a year. You've been exposed to over 200 novel viruses. That is deeply worrying to me. And we're spending seven millions of dollars a year to try and monitor that. Okay. What do we need? We need better lines of defense. He plotted out the total number of veterinarians and Wildlife Disease Association members. It scales roughly with the size of the country. It would be similar for mathematical epidemiologists. The people who've done in my very biased book, the best job of explaining and understanding the epidemic. The great thing about being a mathematical epidemiologist is we all know each other. We see them <laughs> in cocktail bars. That means there is of the order of a hundred of us. That's less than the number of knee surgeons in New York City. It's great for us, but it's deeply worrying for you because we don't have enough people to do the math. And it's way beyond the 1950s rocket science that the people at NASA do. That is very old 20th century science. This is cutting edge nonlinear mathematics. If you look at the number of veterinarians, you can look at the scatter around that line and say, how many veterinarians, frontline defenders, they're usually the people who pick up these new diseases first. How many are there per thousand non-veterinarians in the population, in the populations of different country? As you can see, the, the US is highly competitive with Venezuela and the UK. France is about twice as good. The best place to go with your dog if it's sick is St. Martin in the Caribbean. That's got the highest density of vets on the planet. The more worrying feature is every country in sub-Saharan Africa and many of the Far East have tiny numbers of vets. We desperately need to train more veterinarians and wildlife disease people. And that's, that's an easy thing to do. Okay, we can look at the cost, which I was asked to do. I'm going to do this simple way. If you're a fishery scientist, you can run your finger up and down the column, or if you're a government economist or whatever. If not, you can look at the figure. The big pink square was six months into COVID. How much did it cost the global ecology economy? About $11 trillion. If we go to the current day, that pink dot is bigger than the size of this screen. The little red dot above it, 26 billion, is the cost of doing things to prevent that, the annual cost. And we can explode that out into reducing tropical deforestation, reducing the wildlife trade, looking at spillover from domestic livestock, it's a relatively simple breakdown of costs. We can compare it to other budget items, say the global military budget. It is less than 1% of the cost of that. Think about that because this budget is spent, this is the annual cost, the annual military cost 2019. If you look at the military budget, look at every war fought since the end of the first world war, you have a 50% chance, less than 50% chance of winning a global war in a country bigger than Panama. Our friends in the East should have looked at this graph. We can also do a more detailed comparison to end with. We go back to this figure. It's a very nice calculation that Larry Summers did for influenza epidemics, where you look at the cost of each influenza epidemic, average over each year, and say, what's the average annual cost of epidemics? It's always worth listening to Larry Summers Think about what he said about the British Chancellor of Exchequer two weeks ago. He's now without a job. So Larry Thomas is worth listening to. The average annual cost, average across all those epidemics, is about 250 billion, 10 times the cost of prevention. So those are the numbers we should be thinking. Okay, I could show you a bit more about what to do and the economics of intervention once it goes on, the economics of different strategies, but we could skip that if you want to come back to that in the questions. The bottom line is prevention is much better than cure, and it's substantially cheaper. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Andrew Bepson. And of course, we want to know where, where to put the money if, we have, if you find some. Dr. Catherine Machalaba is the principal scientist of health and policy of the EcoHealth Alliance. And she was a lead author of the World Bank One Health Operational Framework in 2020. 
18. So, uh, Catherine, please uh, uh, welcome. Uh, I welcome you on stage with a round of applause. And you two send us a picture of what is dear to you. I did. And actually, so this is a salamander. This is one of my neighbors. Um, and we we hear that, you know, wildlife get a bad... Where, where exactly do you live if that's your neighbor? Uh, Vermont, yeah. Uh, but, you know, we heard about the viruses that are out there, the unknowns yet discovered. And um, it, this is really serious. And, and wildlife are a reservoir. And, you know, we have to be monitoring their interactions with wildlife, but wildlife are very important for our own health too and the health of our ecosystem. So I think, you know, appreciating what these these ecosystem functions and salamanders are very unique, I think. They're also very cute. I hope you agree. Um, but they they you contribute to carbon sequestration, the way they help with with uh, leaf decomposition and the soil effects. Um, they they consume insects, so actually they contribute to vector-borne disease prevention and control. All of these functions, when we see these little salamanders, we don't think about that ecosystem service. I think this is the cost of inaction when we're not thinking about how we fit into the ecosystem, how we're changing our ecosystems, the really direct and indirect effects on our health and the cost of losing biodiversity, the cost of climate change, the cost of pandemics, the drivers are very similar at the end of the day. And so we have this opportunity, the, you know, the cost of inaction, but then what can we do about it? We can really work together and have these broader effects. So it's not just pandemic prevention, but it's also protecting biodiversity, it's, it's climate action, and it's all contributing to improved health outcomes across the board. Uh, when Elon Musk uh, was uh, offering 100 uh, billion US dollars for something, some invention that could uh, uh, could bind uh, carbon dioxide, um, someone replied on Twitter, can trees apply? And this is my, <laughs> my, my kind of humor because we underestimate the 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 yeah I, I don't like this uh saying of, of eco whatever the cost and, and last uh world health summit i remember in the discussion of the um bmz session um um health um minister from ghana i think said as long as a tree uh is worth more if you cut it in uh yeah. slices rather than a tree with leaves and roots so long trees will be cut and so this fundamental <laughs> i can't call it different from uh, madness of economy of of putting a price on things on one side and not putting a price tag on the priceless unique things in nature uh, at your time at the world bank how many people are aware of this really uh, insufficient pricing I think, you know, we have to have ecosystem services as a part of the equation. I think that's being recognized more and more. It's hard, challenging to do because the interactions are not always linear, you know, and that's why we need those mathematical modelers. Um, and we need observations on the ground. So I think the investment of where to get started to do that is not really well understood. How do we do that at a country level, really at a community level? Uh, we have great examples from conservation on how to do that. I would say one missing piece is, you know, when we look at environmental and social impact assessment, that's often a starting point for development projects. Those processes are inadequate right now. They don't consider the, the full costs and benefits of different decisions. We need to be thinking about long-term impacts on ecosystems and how that contributes to our health. So I think that's somewhere that the world can get started. You know, if, if we're government officials in the room, if we're working with development agencies, that's something that can be changed, you know, and we can do a better job of that through a One Health approach. Yeah, John, John Chan, who has a very strong saying, we're burning the book of life before we've read and understood it. And I love uh, to cite Kim Grutzmacher with a quote that um, if climate crisis is the fever of Mother Earth, the loss of biodiversity is the dementia of Mother Earth. Because in each species that there is, even in this very cute, I agree, salamander, this is the storage of knowledge of evolution of millions and billions of years of how the web of life can work on this planet. And if we destroy each species, we have no idea of what we are losing as far as the, the um, yeah, the wisdom and the dementia is the pathological loss of connections, basically. 
And I love this idea of web of life that this is carrying us. We're part of it. And but this is also not not uh, part of the story that we're telling that uh, we're not the dominant species. We are very dependent on on other species. Where do you think this uh, this can take us when we're talking about prevention and and getting uh, more funding into uh, yeah before spillover? I think the good news is we don't have to do it alone. You know, so the health community we're often left to deal with the consequences, but the drivers are very far upstream in other sectors. There are resources in other sectors, so it's not taking funds away from the health community. It's really empowering other sectors to play a crucial role in risk reduction. I think this is the key opportunity. And I think if we can do this in a way that mobilizes climate finance, mobilizes biodiversity funding, you know, we need to increase increase the, the, the responses, the vulnerabilities we need to address, but we really need to invest in prevention and, and I think appreciate the co-benefits more. I think the more that we use a One Health approach, a planetary health approach to say, you know, who actually benefits from this, who, who faces the trade-offs, who bears those costs, I think that's where we see, okay, this actually, this solution will work for multiple sectors, multiple global challenges. And, and I think that is the key opportunity that we can come together around. Now you've met all the participants on the panel. I would love to have each one of you on the, on the seats because we are filming this and uh, you can only be on screen if you're sitting there. But I want to, um, again, ask everyone who is online to pose question to us. And uh, Kim will uh, see if question and answers are popping up and I'll try to integrate them on the panel. Um, and I say hello to Hannah, who's watching us, because we need more um, active people in transmitting all these topics into public media, into um, stories, into movies, into articles, to raise the awareness, because that on the long run influences also the political decisions. On the first round, I would love to have each one of you to form a little couple. For example, Jochen, I would like to ask you what uh, of the um, all the digits that Andrew and the mathematical um, epidemiologist put up, how much are these part of uh, the governmental knowledge? I, I always uh, wonder myself how is this gap between science and political action, how, how can that be bridged better? Am I on? Yeah, yeah I'm on. Um, well, I think if there is something good in the pandemic, uh, it is that we increase the interface between science uh, and government. Uh, and uh, specifically in, in Germany, we were very lucky to have fantastic uh, uh, scientists uh, who also went out of their usual scientific business and advising uh, uh, the government uh, sometimes for for high personal cost because of once you get out you are also um, a target of uh, attacks uh, and I, I think uh, you Eckert experienced it and Christian and and others too so as well but yes I think it increased. Uh, it should be better in other areas. We have a long tradition in climate change with the IPCC. Uh, when uh, Germany was uh, hosting the CBD COP uh, back in 2008, we started to discuss, discuss about the IPBAS. Uh, it was a long way to go. Some, uh, some colleagues questioned, do we really need this? Uh, where is the gap? Um, and uh, really prominent people. And once I respond, the gap is a thing between your ears. And uh, so luckily now we, we have uh, this kind of scientific advice uh, and uh, now it's more about how to interlink it between the different disciplines and that is where the One Health approach is, I, I think, uh, exactly where we need to go. Maria, um, how does this One, one Health approach <laughs> enter your, your work at the WHO? And wh wh where do you think uh, we can take uh, prevention on the next level? before spillover. You were saying before that there is no glory in prevention, and it's absolutely true, but we need to give some glory to prevention. And that the way to give glory to prevention is to communicate and document the health benefits or co-benefits, as you want to call it, that we obtain from other policies. And I think we are not good on that. We managed to remove lead from uh, gasoline very long time ago, 
And that was an enormous success in terms of environmental health. And probably our IQ today is a little bit bigger, not much, because we are still not there. I'm not talking about you, I mean, uh, but we never communicate about that. I mean, we never communicate the health benefits that we were promoting, we were obtaining because we remove uh, lead from gasoline. So today we need to do the same. We need to respond to your incredibly pessimistic picture by saying, no, no, uh, which is a realistic one. We're saying, okay, this is the way to invest and this is the way to better communicate about primary prevention. One, on climate change, we are in few days, we will be in, in Egypt, all of us. What we are saying is use the health argument for more climate action. Look at the health benefits you can obtain. If you stop using combusting fossil fuels, which contribute largely to global warming and air pollution, if you stop that, if you accelerate transition to uh, healthy, renewable uh, sources of energy, wow, you will reduce the cost of the health system, which is huge, by the way. I'm sure it's not included on your externalities, on the cost of inaction. We are already paying at the hospital level for all of that. We are already paying with the health system. So the benefits will be enormous. Of course, we will reduce the 7 million premature deaths. That will be amazing. The second benefit will be from sustainable food systems. We can, again, enormous health benefits, reducing millions of deaths by promoting healthy diets and reducing all the waste of the food we are having now. The other one is about investments on healthy urban planning, for instance. Imagine a more sustainable transport system, uh, more uh, energy efficiency in our buildings, uh, more uh, roads uh, uh, and, and to, to bike or to walk and less mental health problems. That will be, the benefits will be enormous. So we need to use, as you rightly said, uh, uh, the, the, the benefits from other investments on climate change, one. Second, the no regrets investment. Who will disagree that we need to invest on water and sanitation for everyone? We're still not there. We, during the pandemic, we were, the, one of the basic recommendations was, wash your hands, where? Mm. I mean, billions around the world, they don't have where to wash their hands. We have healthcare facilities in sub, uh, Saharan country, uh, continent where people doesn't have uh, soap or or sanitation at the healthcare facility, not in the in the in their uh, area, at the healthcare facility. How can you call something a healthcare facility if you cannot wash your hands? That's against all the the, the prevention. And then we need to use any opportunity, mayors. We need to put pressure on mayors for them to to have a more comprehensive way of planning our cities. And of course, we need to tell our citizens, all of us as a society, that we need to stop destroying nature. This is the less cost-effective intervention ever. The most uh, sabotage is a kind of auto-sabotage. Another prevention and, and is stop giving subsidies to fossil fuels. At the moment, we are still giving a lot of subsidies to fossil fuels and therefore going against our own uh, capacity to develop. And of course, stop deforestation. So we, we need to communicate on the positive, giving the people the opportunity to understand the benefits of this primary prevention that at the moment has not much visibility and understanding. And that's why we are still not spending much on that while the results could be so uh, amazing in terms of preventing the, the terrible disaster that is in front of us. Uh, thank you, Maria. I would love to uh, show you a picture that's dear to me because each one of the participants had the uh, chance. Um, uh, I'm the founder of Healthy Planet, Healthy People Foundation and of Scientists for Future. So this is the warming stripes. That's a, a symbol killing us that the world is getting hotter and hotter. And um, Maria, you just mentioned visibility. And this picture was taken in 2019, just before the start of the pandemic. And we had a global climate strike and especially the people in the health um, services, nurses, doctors, um, therapists, they stood up. And this is um, Detlef Ganten, the founder of the World Health Summit who got me into public health and into planetary health. And I like about this movie, uh, this, this picture, which is part of a movie as well, um, that 
yeah, we have to be visible from the health sector that we are in a crisis. And this is Klimaschutz gleich Gesundheitsschutz, that climate protection equals health protection. That oftentimes we lose ourselves in the discussion. The money uh, going into climate protection is killing uh, jobs, and, and this is uh, economy against ecological um, investments and stuff. And so the health narrative is very strong, and we were just. <laughs> Yeah, um, mobilizing millions of people around the world. And then this fucking virus killed the biggest uh, movement that we had for a long, long time on the streets. And so uh, this is dear to me. And the next picture is uh, how to communicate these topics, even in times of um, loss of public awareness. This is a campaign that we did from Healthy Planet, Gesunde Erde, Gesunde Menschen. Das Teuerste, was wir jetzt tun können, ist nichts. And if, um, this translates into, and I was very happy that this um, got translated. Next slide. A study on climate and health. The most expensive thing we can do is nothing. And this is against this, or where do we invest? If we still do subsidies for fossil fuels, and for destruction of, of ecosystems, there is enough money, but it goes not only not in the right direction, it goes completely into the wrong direction. So Catherine, you're nodding. How can we get this idea of that the cost of inaction is just about to kill us in the future because we can, with no money in the world, turn back beyond tipping points. How can this thinking be much more um, out there in the world and in the minds of politicians and uh, money givers. Yeah, and great, great examples. I mean, it, I think that we have to all mobilize in different ways. There are many different entry points. Um, I, I think, you know, from a very practical standpoint, countries are taking a One Health approach. They're setting up One Health coordination platforms, bringing together ministries from many different sectors. So, of course, human health, environmental health, agriculture, livestock, but also education, in some cases, community um, outreach. I mean, I think they're they're growing and growing, and it's really exciting to see. And this is changing how decisions are being made. You know, I think slowly, these are very new, but if we invest in this as a standard and say, you know, this is how decisions should be made at institution level, I think, you know, I, I work a lot with the World Bank, and I'm seeing how exciting it is that they've formed a One Health team. There's water and sanitation experts on that. There's social inclusion. And, you know, we're, we're seeing different considerations that are taken into account. I think this is very exciting. From a health and all policy standpoint, this is what we want to be seeing. So investing in, in these um, opportunities just to bring together sectors in a new way. Um, and if I can just share, there is a new World Bank report coming out soon, which I think will really help to reinforce this topic. Oh, very it's a symbol of tipping points. <laughs> once it's, once it's <laughs> in Germany, we say Scherben bring Glück, so broken glasses and luck symbol. And what, what is a very precious commodity? Well. <laughs> the most precious. <laughs> Sorry, I was, I was interrupted. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. So thank you for a dramatic effect. It was um, but, but you know, I think the, the principles that go into this investment framework for prevention are things that are already happening and that we can expand. Um, I'll just briefly uh, just introduce them. So the first is adopting a One Health approach really systematically, um, shifting to pandemic prevention. So using this as the starting point, not this reliance on preparedness. Of course, we need preparedness. We need response when there are epidemics, um, ideally really early on. But really shifting our mindset towards prevention, complying with minimum standards. So we have these for human health. We have these for animal health. We need them for environmental health. I think this is a real gap um, that we can highlight, but really building up systems in a way that you have that minimum capacity and your international obligations are met, like the IHR. Um, focusing on hotspots. So this is really targeting sources of risk. We know where these hotspots are. We saw the maps. Um, we know that there are, you know, conditions are changing. There's typically high biodiversity. There's change in ecosystems. These are anthropogenic 
issues and we we can do something about them. It just takes resources, it takes focus. And then the last is related to this de-risking. So we heard about urbanization, we heard about uh, farms, you know, improving biosecurity, uh, forest, saving forests. So not just focusing on um, reestablishing forests, but also protecting the ones we have. Yep. And that's really crucial. I think this, these are really, at the end of the day, very practical and feasible things. They just need commitment. They need focus. We can't forget, you know, once, once people sort of move on to the next thing, now we have monkeypox, um, you know, we have the Ebola epidemic. I, I, I think there's this tendency that we just move on to the next crisis and we don't learn from it. And we need to, I think we have the tools, we have the solutions, but we need to make this a systematic change. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, uh, Andy, when, when you are putting out a, um, a scientific paper, like the cost of an action that you did in one of the highest ranking, most impact journals, which impact does it really have? Do the right people read it? Do the right people understand it? And um, we're talking about uh, readjusting public money, but where's all the private equity money going when <laughs> we're talking about uh, investing in, in the future in a sustainable way? Well, as a scientist, you, know, you always worry about, does anybody read your papers? <laughs> 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 we spend all our life sitting there writing these things and usually they just disappear without trace. So it's like, whoa, this one worked way, baby. All right. Um, you hope that they have some influence on the political process. And, and the best way that can happen is if the media picks it up, because uh, the politicians don't listen to the scientists until comparatively recently, they mainly listen to the media. And, and so if you can, I mean, there's the difference. If, if I go and talk to a politician, I'm in the same line as the people who want new toilets in schools, this, that, and the other. If the media put pressure on the politicians, it's important. The politician calls me and say, can you come and fill me in on that? And, and that reverses that asymmetry. So getting more science into the media, tragically, the print media is declining and shrinking, but we still have the news media, which is hugely distorted by the sort of Twitter sphere. And there it's very, very hard to tell what's fact and what's fiction and what is complete distortion of everything. So, so we need to think of better ways of dealing with that. In terms of influencing the political system, I, I think the huge distortion is hidden in that figure I showed you of global military spending. Now, that's a huge amount of money for a bunch of things that if they were a national soccer team or something, they'd be firing the coach every week. You know, it's just curious. The American <laughs> soccer team usually can't win a beat against a soccer team bigger than about Panama. In fact, Panama usually wins. Um, the difference is, if that money's not for offense, it's maybe for defense, but it's also, it's a huge investment of the politicians in money that comes back to them as campaign funds. The best thing you can do is make huge political, well, it, for, as, as, to, as a defense company, is to invest in both political or any political parties, because when they get elected, they'll pay you back 20 to 50 times annually. Nobody on Wall Street gets that level of investment. And that's the same thing with the oil companies. Any political donations they make get matched 20 to 50 times by investment in oil and fossil fuels. So changing the way that money from the people screwing up the planet goes into the political systems would mean politicians have to listen to people with bigger problems than where to go on holiday in their private jets. That's one set of problems. The other thing that I think is also vital to consider is we tend to think of the biodiversity crisis and climate change as different problems. They're not. Climate change is the biggest part of the solution to the, sorry, biodiversity is the biggest part of the solution to climate change. If you look at the famous Mauna Loa CO2 curve, that's steadily going up, those of you without a Greek classical education and slight science will realize the worst situation is getting worse. There's a second part to that curve, and that's the annual variation in CO2. And that's because the world's forests and savannas suck CO2 out of the atmosphere every year. Fossil emissions put it out, trees bring it back in. At the moment, fossil emissions are exceeding tree being able to suck it in. What happens to that curve if you just removed all the trees? So remove the little bit of the curve that goes down every year. What does that curve look like then? Well, we're desperately worried about 
concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere going through 500. It's getting closer and closer. It's about 440 at the moment. If you take that removal by trees out, it went through there back in 1961. That's something we're not paying any economic benefits for, but we would be frying by now. Say this again. If, if you without take trees, those annual mm -hmm. cycles out, mm -hmm. just let it go up without the removal, it goes through 500 parts per million in 1961, about five years after it starts. So that's a huge ecosystem mm -hmm. services yeah. that the forests that were chopping down, the people in Brazil have tended them to their friends for political donations. You've got a big problem there. So we should be restoring ecosystems and massively protecting the ones we have. And that also gives us cleaner air and all the things we've heard of the benefits associated with that. And it also gives us the world's most important commodity when we don't throw it around, water. Water is soon going to be more valuable than gasoline because there's a finite amount of water on this planet. And it's central to health, central to agriculture. It comes from the sky, sure, but it usually falls into forests. It's cleaned in those forests and then flows from those in streams. If you don't have forests, we'll have less water. And then civil unrest and everything else you don't want. <sighs> I'm sorry to be Dr. Doom. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you spend your life looking at these figures. It's like, we've got a problem here. And what are we talking about? Oh, uh, you know, all the wonderful things that are discussed in the political arena. No, but you're completely right that um, the, the, the amount of time spent on, on positive lobbyism and, and the, the, um, the amount of money that goes. I'm a big fan of the Merchants of Doubt movie from, if you, you're probably aware of that, uh, dealing uh, with the uh, um, mechanism of putting false experts in talk shows when we're talking about media and creating a sense of false balance. And with the same mechanism, this was, uh, Maria, you, you know, this in, in smoking prevention, they said, well, it's not sure that smoking causes cancer. As in the, on the same token, they said, oh, well, the, the climate scientists are not sure about their data even, so we can wait. And this this kills 20, 30 years. You can't <laughs> delay uh, the, the scientific truth forever, but the, the amount of disinformation uh, put in the world now with the social media, this is really frightening me too. And so uh, the, the next round I would love to do on the panel, and then uh, Kim maybe uh, can add something from, from the room and um, elsewhere, who's on the dark side, who's on the rake, who is preventing everything that's so logical and, and so um, evident. Why isn't this happening? I mean, I'm, I'm part of uh, Club of Rome. We have the um, Grenzens Wachstums limits to growth um, for 50 years now. And who's on the break, Jochen? <laughs> no pressure. Sorry, it's getting a little bit too pessimistic for me now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm coming from this part um, of Germany, uh, the Rhine Valley. Yeah, we know. are genetically optimists, and uh, <laughs> I, I, my motto is that frustrated bonds will not uh, save this world. Yeah. So be optimistic. And I think we have learned quite quite a lot. Uh, look here at the Alliance Against Health Risk and Wildlife Trade. Who, who talked about it? Uh, more than a year uh, ago when we launched it in, in uh, Marseille. And I was lucky to give the keynote there in my former um, um, provision as um, uh, secretary for the Ministry of uh, Environment. And uh, also about the costs uh, um, of inaction, we know much better. Uh, I mean, uh, for in the health sector, it's quite easy. Compared to other areas, it's quite easy because you can talk about premature uh, uh, deaths, for example, and you, we have done it with the Lancet report and uh, uh, on, on the air pollution, for example. So we, we know quite well about the costs and uh, once you know about the costs, uh, action will follow. Maybe not immediately, but stepwise uh, and it could be faster, but I see this, uh, this movement in the right direction. And let me say one word more. Uh, we are talking uh, the whole time about financing. And um, if I look now in my new um, responsibility as uh, uh, Secretary for uh, Development Cooperation, if you look at the 
costs uh, to fulfill the 2000 to, to meet our 2000 uh, agenda 2030 targets it's undoable if you look at the trillions that are needed annually uh, we are so far away from it uh, so even if we increase the leverage factors from public uh, finance to, uh, to uh, private finance we, we will not be there so we need to look at other instruments than simply financing. And I will give you an example. We are talking here, for example, about deforestation uh, as one of the triggers of the drivers, uh, also uh, health risks through pandemics, so not pandemics. Uh, we are discussing now at the EU level, and we did it in, in Germany two years ago, about a supply chain law, uh, deforestation-free supply chains. And that doesn't cost a penny. It's just regulation, and we need to discuss about regulation also in the agriculture sector. I mean, the sector and the forest sectors, they are uh, galaxies away from uh, sustainability. Uh, so we need to look at uh, into the political reforms, otherwise public budgets will not make it. We need to have a new area uh, of regulation, tough regulation, even if it is sometimes painful, but I think that's the way to go. And I see some movement in this direction uh, as well. And I'm coming back to what, what Svenja uh, Schulze uh, proposed together with the US uh, in, in Washington, right? And now to also with regard to our spending, where we are talking about um, uh, money and support for our partners in developing countries. We need to make sure that this goes into reforms. Uh, what do you do with biodiversity spending if you are in a completely corrupt system? Nothing. Nothing will change. So uh, using our, our support uh, to, to change the systems globally, but also in uh, on the national level in, the, in our partnering countries. I mean, this is the key also for the discussion we are having here. Yeah, thanks for an optimistic uh, counterpart to Andrew. <laughs> oh, I said Andrew. Okay, he, that means that was bad. <laughs> he, he said, uh, only your mother says, Andrew, if you've done something wrong. <laughs> so, Andy, thank you for being realistic and Jochen for being... I, I, I was responding not to Andy, but to you. <laughs> I know, I know, but, but I was trying to get the curve from the diagnosis to the hopeful part at uh, in the last half an hour that we are still sharing. But I think it's important to, to talk about who's uh, against all these things. Because uh, um, uh, example, as long as biodiversity is seen as something, oh, these are tree huggers and they, they, they love animals, we overlook that 20% roughly of all the meat production in the world is fed to other animals, <laughs> it's fed for dogs and cats, and and nobody's talking about this. That that uh, people think, oh, they love animals and they kill other animals to feed their loved ones. And this is so absurd that I I work as a stand-up comedian sometimes in, in German public television. I I have this 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 joke that I think meat production would immediately go down if you would regulation is a good point, Jochen. If you would force people to except that when you buy a, um, a pound of cheap meat, that you have to take a, um, a whole bucket of 20 liters of manure home. <laughs> so you hand it over <laughs> the whole shit together with the meat, just to illustrate that everything that we do has a price. And we don't see what we're doing as long as we do everything to tell the consumer that he can do whatever he wants and um yeah and and not show the destruction that's associated with a certain kind of of um diet for example so maria who's the, in in your opinion your experience who's who's on the break hey i can give you a <laughs> list but that will be confidential but let me let me uh let, let's let's try to keep putting some uh, positive prescriptions to the very good uh, diagnosis that we have. Diagnosis is not very positive, but let's put some prescriptions here, a uh, positive one. At the COP next, uh, in a few days, uh, there will be a health pavilion. So that the health argument for more climate action will be there. And what we are doing is our health pavilion will be represented by a big two lungs. So we are using the health argument to remind people that climate change is about their health as well. I think that's a very 
maybe Machiavellic uh, on, on, on going around this uh, narrative and telling people that this is not just about uh, you know, things that you consider very far away or something for which you, there is nothing you can do. It's an apocalypse, so I, there is nothing I can do. We are all going to die, so let's enjoy until we die. No, it, this is about our lungs. So we put it a couple of huge lungs, very artistic, very nice, but to remind people that this is about their health. So maybe on this communication and then using the politicians, we need to mobilize as well our citizens and remind them that health can be maybe the, the biggest motivation to do more on climate change and to protect biodiversity. I think one by one, our citizens, they will vote, they will have uh, the possibility to influence the media and the media will influence politicians. So we need to make sure that our people is in our side. I mean, they understand what this is about it and they have something to do. So health can be this very strong motivation to do more. And that's why we have as well these um, prescriptions for, for, for recovering a healthy a green recovery. We did those prescriptions in WHO as a manifesto uh, in June 2020, because we knew that governments will start to invest on this recovery. And we wanted to make sure or trying to be sure that the investments will go in the right direction. So we made six prescriptions. One, stop destroying ecosystems, biodiversity, stop uh, deforestation. I mean, this is not good for health. This is not good for everything, for life. Second, invest on the no regrets, water, sanitation, and, and, and having electricity for, for, for healthcare facilities, at least around the world. Third, accelerate this transition to, to clean uh, renewable sources of energy. Otherwise, this combustion of fossil fuels is literally literally killing us. Four, look at the, the healthy urban planning. I mean, your cities needs to protect your health, not to, to put you at risk. Five, the sustainable food systems and the waste that we are generating, fertilizers, uh, how we are consuming animals and how we can change as well our di diets. And the last prescription was about uh, the fossil fuels uh, subsidies. Stop giving fossil fuels. And all of that, we try to pass it in, in positive and mobilize our own troops, the, the, the health professionals, and an initiative that we are now launching, and I hope everybody will join. It's, it's not a big thing, but it gives a, a signal of leading by example. We are decarbonizing the health system. You know, the health system contributes to around 5% of the global carbon footprint. And uh, of course, it's not a big deal, but it's, it's very rewarding for health professionals. And it's a way to mobilize them, to keep them uh, committed and, and, and understanding. And if the health professionals understand, maybe they will be able as well to pass the message that is not just about prescribing to treat diseases. You cannot just uh, uh, prescribe Ventolin if a child has uh, uh, asthma. You need to understand where is this child living and maybe it's living on a street in London that is completely polluted. That's why legislation, I fully agree with you, is fundamental. If by law we could say WHO standards on air quality needs to be implemented by law, wow, that will be already an amazing opportunity. And why not? Can yeah. You go for that? Yeah. Can you sign up? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, at the COP, I talked to Rosamond, whose daughter died of, of air pollution, and she had an asthma attack on, on the age of nine. And it was so important that she fought uh, in court to have air pollution on the death certificate, because we need personal stories that are touching us to get the media attention for these topics, because they are abstract for many people. And uh, now I'd like to invite Kim with the iPad and um, ask what your, uh, what is the online community thinking? So I have a question from uh, Craig Davis. Um, if the extra funding for these problems are not to be redirected health funds, but from other sectors and partners, can you give some specific examples of funding sources and problems? Okay. Who wants to answer? I'm, I'm happy to answer that. 
as usual, I'm, I'm a huge fan as an optimist of Henry Kissinger. And, and Henry Kissinger said, ladies and gentlemen, I have my answers. I'm, I'm ready to manipulate your questions. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, was, I had an answer to the previous question, so I could readdress it to that. It, it, it's essentially what gives me optimism. A person walking around this building gives me optimism. Bill Gates. Bill Gates and Bill and Melissa Gates, the Gates Foundation has completely transformed the way we do international health for poor people living with tropical diseases every day of their life, as well as for HIV, tuberculosis, et cetera. That's a brilliant example of someone doing something innovative and creative in a society where small amount of funds were available for them to do that, to build up something that affects the life of us all, and then put that money to a good use. It would be great if others followed his lead. To me, it's farcical that the two wealthiest people in the world at the moment, or two or three of them, have got this pathetic space race going on. Mm. I mean, what Freudian does that tell you about them? They could have much better spent the money on a psychologist and then done good things to save the planet <laughs> and the climate. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm really optimistic about this opportunity because I think we, we heard about regulation, but also voluntary guidelines. I think there is just a genuine lack of awareness about where to start. And when we look at, say, extractive industries and some of the drivers of disease emergence, I don't think it's this intention to, to you know, cause these these pandemics. It's really sort of this awareness about how do you do prevention? You know, where does spillover prevention start? When we look at the interfaces, this is, you know, extractive industries, mining, timber logging, changes in, in um, livestock production that really introduce risk. It's also tourism, people, you know, doing ecotourism, trying to do the right thing often, um, but then coming into contact with, with species. It's encroach, you know, encroaching into wildlife habitat. So I think the more that we find these entry points, and we have colleagues here from the animal health sector, we have colleagues from the conservation sector, I think this is really good because we can bring together the solutions and, and that's not a cost to the health system. That's, you know, mobilizing other expertise. I think community engagement too, this is something that is, of course, crucial for, for health uh, protection. But when we think about spillover prevention, communities are on the front lines. People in in occupational settings are on the front lines. Are people, um, you know, going into extractive industry sites and hunting uh, for their protein provision, or is there a regulation that that companies that you know can afford to provide an alternate protein source? This is a decision. This is an economic decision, but it's not a billion dollar decision. This is a you know how do I finance the operations at my site? What do I prioritize, and how do I do that community engagement? So. I, I think it's, it's you know, we, we need the financing at, at some level to get things catalyzed, to find those entry points, but it's not um, this, this huge cost to the system. I think there's a lot we can do with the knowledge we already have and the champions we already have. <laughs> I, could. I would love to... Maybe I can yeah. just add, yeah, add one word. Uh, I think, well, it's a good example, uh, Annie, what, what you said, but but still, I mean, I appreciate that some of these uh, super rich guys uh, are also coming from the philanthropic uh, side. But uh, I mean, uh, we also have to look that uh, the inequality in, in the world increased during the pandemic. So super rich got m m were more than doubling uh, their richness and the poorest went even more in uh, into poverty uh, and hunger. So uh, there are too much places to avoid taxes. We can get these revenues out of there and then we can re-channel uh, it um, to do what is needed also by, by, by uh, public uh, budgets. And I'm happy that the Chancellor announced 1.5 billion annually as of 2025 uh, for uh, for biodiversity, uh, but this has to be capitalized by bringing in not only philanthropic. It's good that we have them, but also to make uh, private investments in line with biodiversity, in line with climate change. I mean, just coming back on that, the reason I gave Bill and Melinda Gates as an example is they've hugely emphasized capacity training in the countries of the world where tropical disease is a problem. So the number of people trained to deal with that, though, has increased hugely thanks to their investment in that. Yeah. And, and I think that's, that is the huge thing that gives me tons of optimism. There are so many uh, knowledgeable people in this room. So please, um, we start with you. I, I have a microphone here. If you just uh, say, just uh, 
Yeah. Well, one word about your expertise, and if you uh, stand up, yeah. you can uh, be be yeah. caught in the camera. So, thank you very much. I'm Catherine Urbais from the Global Alliance on Health and Pollution. So, you mentioned at the beginning that we are in a crisis. So, actually, we have a triple a triple planetary crisis, and we're talking about biodiversity, climate change, and sometimes forgotten pollution. So, Dr. Maria Neida, she mentioned that we have per year. 7 million of premature death, only air pollution. But we're not talking about chemical pollution or any kind of other pollution. So that's a big number if you want to compare. It's more than what we have as a, a cumulative death due to COVID, if we want to compare. It's not nice, but it's, it's what it is. So um, Joshua, you mentioned that we have the IPCC, we have the IPTS. But now we are in a process of negotiation for a science policy panel on chemical waste and pollution. So then we assume that we have three panels for the three planetary crises. So what is the situation? Where are we lacking? Is it financial? Is it policy or is it poly-based poly policies that the governments then can translate, is especially in low middle income countries? Thank you. Thank you. I'd love to collect some of the questions in the room and then, then ask all the panel panelists. Uh, no, you, you were first. Can you pass the microphone, please? Yeah, Chris Walzer from the Wildlife Conservation Society. So first of all, um, compliments on this panel. This is the first time in many years at this meeting. Also compliments to you for pulling this together. Where we're really seeing discussions across sectors and, and recognizing the interlinkedness of the four global crises. So well done on that. However, I, I got a shock just now when we got heard Bill and Melinda Gates mention and driving anything forward. That really scares me a lot. Um, I personally am feel threatened if one individual that is super rich can define global agendas. So I'm absolutely on board that we need to fund. Uh, multilateralism, we need to drive multilateralism forwards. And so my question is, how do we deal with the competition between the multilaterals for funding streams? How do we actually get true transsectoral funding streams so that FAO and WOA and WHO are not competing for the same funding streams? Thank you. Hmm. There, there will be one event on, on Tuesday. Um, maybe, Kim, you want to say something about this? <laughs> Um, yes, there will be an event on Tuesday. It's um, uh, it's actually uh, it's it's the launch um, of the One Health Joint Plan of Action of the Quadripartite, um, which is uh, a side event of the World Health Summit on Tuesday evening. It will be um, on site here in Berlin at the Museum for Natural History as well as uh, online. So you're very welcome to join that. And, and the Quadrit. Quadripartite, yes. <laughs> yes, so it's uh, the, the Food and Agriculture Organization, the World Health Organization, uh, the World Organization for Animal Health and the UN Environment Program. And it's uh, not exactly a funding stream, but it is uh, a joint work and a joint action plan that will be launched. So um, hopefully there eventually will be some funding also going to implement that um, joint action plan. Yes. Other questions in... Um... Uh, Kim, if you cover, cover the, the row three and I come here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, sir, for moderating this important discussion. Ahmed from uh, WHO East Mediterranean region. Uh, very stimulating discussion, but in fact, just I'd like to share with you the other angle of, of what we are talking about. I'm sure many of us have attended these similar discussions many years back, and I still remember that Swedish girl who was really brave enough to shout on politicians who have been meeting there in, in New York, I think, a few years back. And I still watch, you know, the, the, the BBC on Earth, you know, David Attenborough, who is running this program live, and he's sending us really warning all the time until his recent participation in the New York also High Level Summit 2019. And I want to bring you an example from real life. You know, I am from the Eastern Mediterranean region. Uh, the whole of Africa, Africa is, is hit by severe drought. Yesterday, 
the hospital in in Makadishu, in sorry in Bontland, they don't have beds for children because of malnutrition, because of infections. People in in Syria and Lebanon are suffering from cholera because of lack of of, of clean water, because of the poor sewage system. People in Afghanistan are suffering from from malaria, from outbreaks of measles because of floods. So there is a mixture of problems there outside our room. So my question to, to the panelists, you know, wh wh where is where is the problem of not acting on the symptoms, as you said? We have been talking about the root causes, as you have mentioned for many times, many years back. There is no action from those who are responsible for that. But we as health leaders, economists and others, uh, you know, we have a responsibility to act on the symptoms of these like, you know, droughts, floods, uh, cholera, uh, outbreaks of other diseases. So this is my question. Thank you very much. Thanks for, for bringing a multi-perspective view on this uh, in the room. And uh, two more questions, and, and then uh, we're back on the panel. Yes, hi, Nina Jamal from Four Paws uh, Animal Welfare. Uh, thank you so much for this panel. Um, my question is related to the, the solutions that you identified or the areas of focus. So Dr. Maria Nera, you, you identified a set of measures that need to happen so that we can prevent future pandemics and also tackle climate change. And we've also talked about the Financial Intermediary Fund as, um, as an option for financing. Do you see a possibility for tackling the root causes in the pandemic instrument? And do you see space in the Financial Intermediary Fund to tackle the phase before spillover instead of just focusing the financing on post-outbreak? And I'll hand over to... Thank you. Um, Catherine Tersaga, I'm, I'm an uh, eco-epidemiologist working at the prevention policy part now. And I'm very intrigued when we would want to try to apply a climate health policy in Belgium. It is really difficult because there are so many factors that kind of get into the way. And um, what we see is that it's really important to get into this behavioral change. If you get people to actually understand why they are one, why you want to drive this change, you might actually get what you want. The problem is that often this inequity, it really makes things much more difficult. So if you want, for instance, in these in the areas where you have a tropical forest, you want people not to go into the forest to hunt. Why would you want, why would they stop doing that if they don't have any reason to, if they have no money to feed themselves. So you need this behavioral Thing, or you need to actually need some socio sociologists, or you need more than just health and environment to actually tackle this problem, I guess. I wonder how you would take this into the alliance. Yeah. Um, I hope the panelists remember some of the questions <laughs> to address. Each one has, has uh, one little statement, and then I would love to uh, uh, start with a roundup. Andrew, you first. Andy. Thank you. Um, again, so sort of briefly returning to the sort of the, the Bill Gates issue and, and spreading out from that bit, because I think there's two aspects to that. One, what Gates did was to say, we have all these different diseases. Let's identify the experts for each different type of disease and get them to form panels to do things about it. So it wasn't a monothetic one person doing one thing. It did have the advantage that one person with a ton of money could make things happen very quickly. The opposite of that is international organizations with lots of committees with very worthy intentions, which make things happen really, really slowly towards infinity. And that's my big worry about these things. They're, they're too urgent to be addressed by multifaceted international panels. The classic example would be the Convention on Biodiversity, which has too many components, too many nations, all of which have to be unanimous on each one. And that's just bogged down in its own lack of speed and initiative. In contrast to that, what's been sitting on the back burner at the UN since about 2015 is a global convention on water. That's a monothetic issue. The only real international convention that works is also a monothetic issue, the Montreal Protocol that deals with ozone. If you're going to have many nations have single issues to deal with, and I don't think health sits easily into a single issue. It's many different things. So, A, it would be great if the UN speeded up and thought about water, because if we can conserve the world's water, it will have a huge impact on health, biodiversity, and agriculture. And it's something that a relatively sluggish but well-intended organization could do a lot with quite quickly. 
you know, I think the, the, thank you for all the questions are really important. I think a lot of it comes down to context. So right now we know the, the global drivers, the global issues, the conditions are so different in each community, in each country, the interfaces, the community preferences, the needs, you know, the the, the food and, and water security options. I mean, this and it's and it's dynamic, too. So I think we have to appreciate that context is is, you know, we need funding mechanisms that are flexible enough for countries to shape the direction for communities to really be able to shape what that looks like. I, I am really hopeful about the Financial Intermediate Fund. Prevention is in the name. I would say right now it's probably in name only. I think if there's earmarked funding for prevention, that's you know something that could make a huge difference. There's also the Nature for Health initiative that Germany has led on. Uh, we need a lot more funding to come in, a lot more partners implementation wise. I mean, I, I think this is a big opportunity, but I think when, you know, it's not just pandemic risk, it's not just epidemic risk, it's it's flooding, it's drought. We need to look at these in a very comprehensive way. And right now, the One Health Coordination platforms that we're seeing, they're really focused on epidemic risk. That's somewhere that chemical pollution could come in, food security, you know, floods. I think we're not utilizing those mechanisms to the extent that they really can be be mobilized. I would also say I'm very hopeful about the quadripartite. I'm really investing a lot of personal time to, to be part of that um, initiative. I think it's very important. I think it also needs to include other partners going forward, You know, not just the four agencies, but really across the UN and intergovernmental system. Let me be a, a little bit provocative here. Uh, COP27. You know, we all say it, and because it's an acronym, you don't even realize what you are saying, but it means conference of the parties for 27 years, 27 years, because COP27 is not just a slogan. It means that there have been 28, actually, years of negotiations. It's a little bit too much, and then and, and we can't afford this speed looking at the magnitudes of the problem we have. Similar for, for chemicals, I agree with you. I mean, the moment we are talking, mountains, millions of electronic waste and devices, some of them generated by, anyway, um, uh, <laughs> they end up on a huge mountain in, in developing countries. And then the kids, the children are recycling those pieces of metals, which are very toxic, yeah. and then making maybe $1 a day. And you know why? Because there is a market. Somebody is buying that. There is a market. So it's not that the people in Africa decided to recycle this and keep $1. Somebody's buying it because only 17% of this electronic waste is recycled properly. So that's another issue. Of course, all of those chemicals are affecting as well. Now we have more and more evidence about affecting our brain. So maybe we are losing IQ and this is this explains some of the things we are discussing here. Yeah. But um, <laughs> anyway, the, the very interesting question about this, how we coordinate all of those funds. I think it has to be coordinated at the country level. We don't have many experiences, unfortunately, but there are some countries that they decide, this is my development plan. Those are my, my priorities. This is my strategy. And if we have, and we are lucky to have uh, donors and supporters from the UN and from bilateral, please put your financial uh, injections here in my strategic plan. Sounds very idealistic, but this should be the way maybe to do it, at least at country level. On global issues, I think we need to, yeah, to, to be very strategic, particularly now on where to invest. On the chemicals, again, the pollution, if you look at the three crises, you will realize that if we start to put in place the, the stopping destruction of ecosystems, uh, more sustainable consumption and production, all of these three crises have a common uh, uh, causes, and therefore we could provide as well results for the three of them. Uh, my colleague, uh, dear Dr. Hamed, from, from the regional director of EMRO, I agree, we need to treat the symptoms as well. We cannot uh, just uh, look at the, the root causes, we need to, as well to treat the symptoms. But because we have so many symptoms, we still have cholera when we know very well that cholera is so much associated to water scarcity, lack of sanitation, pollution of the water we are drinking, and we are still there. Come on, we need to sort it out the problem of access to water and sanitation. For sure, our water is one of the most important conditions of our health together with energy now. And uh, so 
Uh, and of course, yes, there is a space in the pandemic treaty in the preparedness. Uh, very good question. Very, there has to be. It will be a big mistake if environmental health is not included. I mean, the, the tackling the causes of uh, those diseases is not included in the pandemic treaty will be a big, big mistake. Behavioral, of course, sociologists that are very much welcome. We need to change that yeah. as well. We have to, only two minutes left, so I uh, would love to uh, pass on the word to you, Jochen, but uh, with one question in mind for 30 second answers. We have huge problems, we need a lot of money. So one imaginary question to raise some hope. If you had $1 billion to prevent future pandemics, what is your boldest idea? Where would you put the money? And the only person in the room has to uh, really think about $1 billion is, is Jochen. Okay. Uh, although we are short in time, just uh, a brief yeah, answers sure. uh, to, to what was asked. Uh, number one is, yes, uh, we definitely, I definitely support increased uh, and enhanced policy, science, science policy interfaces also in the area of uh, chemicals uh, and po pollution. Number two, uh, one UN getting out of the silos, uh, we do support it and we can do something uh, as parties, as, as you said, uh, to force the different entities to join forces and do th things to, uh, collaboratively. Uh, we heard about the quad, uh, quadripartite, uh, we support it and we push for it uh, a lot. The same as the Global Alliance for Food Security and, uh, and for example, the FIFA, very, very insisted that the WHO has a big say uh, in, in the World Bank structure uh, there as well. Um, and uh, just let me add, because it was uh, mentioned that we have many crises, and we do have another one, and that is the crisis of multilateralism, uh, starting uh, with the invasion by a terroristic president into another country, which puts so much pressure into the whole system, apart from what happened in Ukraine itself. Uh, so was a, what needs to follow out of that, we have to invest into resilient uh, societies where we do have a, an increased uh, number of autocratic systems in the world. We do have shrinking spaces for civil society in many countries. So that is one, one area where we uh, want to support in, uh, in, in, in the next uh, years to come much more to, to strengthen the, the forces of uh, societies to be more resilient. Uh, your question with the one billion, of course, I'm an economist. I would not put anything on one um, on one issue, uh, but uh, the fifth uh, would be would be there uh, because I think it's a very important approach um, and um, some other areas. But definitely a big shrink would go. Uh, to restoration, because if we want to keep what we have in biodiversity, we have to invest in restoration and for landscape uh, restoration, because this will cover the needs of an uh, in increasing number of people in the world, uh, and of course, uh, increased demand uh, for materials. Thank you. Maria, you already said give the, all the money to the WHO. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine, yes. where would you put your money? What's you your know, boldest idea? I think if we, you know, I agree with the thief. I think if we really have to earmark it for prevention, I think that um, can be a catalyst once we get started. And I really appreciate our gracious hosts from the International Alliance Against Health Risks in the Wildlife Trade, because this is making those entry points very tangible. It's bringing together different groups and, and really creating a space for exchange of knowledge. And we haven't had something like that before. So I thank you so much for, for you know, launching that. I think we need that across the board. We'll learn from your example. And I think we have to invest in it and see what works, see what we can learn from that really at a country level. And, and you know, that's not at odds with the joint plan of action on One Health. That's really a mechanism that implementation can happen. So use it as a, a, a catalyst, make sure it goes to true prevention at source and, and you know, learn from there and keep investing in it. And yeah, well, a, a billion isn't enough. We need at least 10 to 20 times that annually. It, it would go a long way to the restoration in my backyard. But what I would spend <laughs> it on if it's just a billion is, is training the vets and wildlife technicians from all those countries in the line below that graph. That would be, I think, the most spectacular return on investment, both for diseases, agriculture, et cetera. 
I want to thank uh, the panelists. I want to thank uh, all the people watching online and you. This is not the last session on this at the WHS. We have the Healthy Planet, Healthy People session in room Oceania. Oceania. Um, just starting in half an hour, we have a session tomorrow, Engaging Globally for Planetary Health. So please keep up the spirit that I that we saw in this room of uh, getting in contact using regulation, using best examples, using media, because, um, yeah, there's a lot to do. Thank you very much.